Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases, by simply using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website for your chance to win one of our cool prizes. For more information, please visit www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I have some breaking news about the EPA. And we're also going to talk about how beet juice is helping keep roads safe this winter. Also, the Monarch Conservation Express and a study about how native bees are exposed to neonicotinoids and other pesticides. So first, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. Welcome to Colorado. We've had our first snowstorm, three inches of wet snow. So in the, the period of a week, we've passed from fall into winter. Wow. I love the change of seasons, but I'm not quite ready yet for the white stuff to fall. In any event, how are things going with your bees, Tom? Well, I've already had some losses, um, which is typical of what we've seen the last few years. Hard to say what's going with the bees. We'll know in spring. Winters have become very difficult. On average, what has been the general progression as far as bee losses during the winter for you? My operation is relatively small compared to the big commercial outfits. In the past, they might have considered a a 10% winter loss pretty much ordinary, 15% in a more challenging winter. In my case... My winter losses, because I could pay much closer attention to the colonies individually, would run 2 to 5%. And uh, they've been as high as 60% over the last few years. I'm just about down to nothing. Hopefully the spring will have some good news. All we could do is just hope for the best. Now, Tom, from what I understand, you have some breaking news about EPA and its decision about sulfoxiflor. Could you share with our listeners what the scoop is? Well, I think they should remember that they heard it here first. It's going to hit the major news outlets soon. As we've said on this program, the Ninth Circuit Court in California ordered the EPA to vacate their unconditional approval of a pesticide called sulfoxiflor. And they were given 45 days in which to comply. Well, today they finally made the decision to comply. A little late, but not all that late. And they have revoked the registration of sulfoxiflor, which raises some very interesting questions. Uh, I've found out by way of a commercial beekeeper, so many of these facts will bear a little scrutiny as we go on, but I think they're accurate, and that is the EPA, the question before everybody is, now what happens to the to the stocks on hand, the sulfoxiflor stocks that are in the stores, in farmers' warehouses, wherever? The EPA's position apparently is that if if it's not a registered product, they have no jurisdiction. The other side of that argument would be that these are this is a toxic compound, and we know that very well because of its history, because it's gone through the process at least partially. And as a toxic compound, it 
it would have to be registered before it could be used. So those are the two sides. But if, if what is being said about the EPA is accurate, it's another example of this agency's efforts to avoid the law and avoid its responsibilities under the law. But we're the first ones to, to uh, announce this decision. Well, Tom, the big question is, what are they going to do with the remaining product? When you think about the different situations that have gone on where environmental impact was huge, industry always finds a way to wiggle out of their responsibility to take action and do something to protect the environment. And I'm just wondering, okay, well, are we going to see sulfoxiflor renamed as something else and then shoved in some other agricultural product. How do you get rid of something so toxic like sulfoxaflor? Well, what's been suggested is that those stocks on hand be returned to the manufacturer for a refund. If you agree with the EPA, this, this highly toxic substance, sulfoxaflor, might just as well be water. They can do anything they want with it because it isn't registered. If you accept the other side of the argument, they can do nothing with it because it isn't registered. And it's been suggested that the way to liquidate those stocks on hand would be to return them to the manufacturer for a refund. Now you're talking about the stock that has not been applied to the different crops. Right. This would be Whatever is on hand in farmers' warehouses and outlets of various kinds, whatever stocks are on hand. I just want to point out, folks, that sulfoxaflor, this ruling applies only to sulfoxaflor as it applies as a foliar application. So you're talking about, I don't know how many pounds of this chemical that is currently sitting in warehouses all across America. I don't know if we even know that. Well, it'll be interesting to see what Dow does as far as working with the different agricultural groups to take back this product and how they intend to dispose of it. Obviously, this isn't something that's just going to dissipate you know, by sitting outside. They need to be really responsible with it. Well, I think we can conclude that the EPA's position is the position of Dow because it's very clear over multiple instances that the EPA is has been captured and is controlled by the very companies it's supposed to regulate. So the EPA's position that they have no jurisdiction is most likely the expression of the chemical industry position. Tom, what do you think this is going to mean as far as other neonicotinoids such as clothianidin and imidacloprid? It's, uh, it's hard to say, but the evidence, the scientific evidence condemning these products is mounting and, and the EPA has allowed it to become so entrenched in agriculture in this country that to extricate itself from that is going to be very challenging. I don't know what it's going to mean, but I think that the, the tide of the evidence is going to demand that something be done other than these evasive steps that the EPA has continued to take. Well, It'll be interesting to see what exactly happens with the other chemicals, especially since industry has spent so much money trying to convince the public that not only are they necessary, but the bees actually like neonicotinoids, which is preposterous. Well, you know, the comparison has been made to nicotine, the attractiveness of nicotine, and it appears that if if offered the choice between uh syrup that has been treated with the neonicotinoids and syrup that hasn't, the bees prefer the treated syrup. Just like when Snow White accepted the apple from the witch and wound up in the deep sleep. 
Well, it's even worse. It it would mean that Snow White liked those apples. Well, she did. She took a bite out of it because she didn't know what was in it. These systemic pesticides certainly are the poison apple for not only for the honeybees, but for many native pollinators and uh, aquatic invertebrates and soil organisms. These are very devastating compounds, and uh, the regulators are doing everything they can to avoid the reality of the degree to which the land has been poisoned. It's almost beyond comprehension, and they're very carefully avoiding getting into that subject. Now, that's interesting that you say that because our next topic concerns beet juice. And the majority, if not all, of the commercially grown beets in America are GMO beets. And the next topic is how beet juice is helping to keep roads safe this winter. So, Tom, could you elaborate on this subject for our listeners? Well, this is a new wrinkle in the story of systemic pesticides, neonicotinoids, and it appears that it may be a big wrinkle. When uh, beets are used to produce sugar, the end, one of the end products is what's called beet juice or beet juice molasses. After it's gone through the, the whole process and the sugar has been extracted from it, this is the end result. And of course, Everybody is always looking for some use for these apparently worthless byproducts, and what they found is that it can be used in road de-icing, and what it accomplishes is it lowers the melting point. Uh, salt brine alone will reduce the melting point of ice to about 5 degrees, as I read it. The addition of beet juice... About 30% beet juice and the rest a salt brine or rock salt will lower the melting point to 20 below zero. So it has some definite advantages, but the wrinkle comes from evidence that the levels of the neonicotinoids in this beet juice are astoundingly high, 800 par parts per billion or higher. Now, a part per billion can be terminal for a colony of honeybees over time. Uh, certainly can be terminal for native bees, and there's a study that recently came out that we'll talk about in a minute, I think. Um, but this is being applied to the to the woods for de-icing, and the concern is that one of the Remedies for the pollinator losses and the monarch losses has been the suggestion that we should have habitat improvement. And part of that is habitat improvement along the highways. There's a corridor that's been proposed running diagonally across the United States for monarch habitat improvement along the roadsides. <clears throat> but we may be contaminating the roadsides at phenomenal levels with these neonicotinoids. And nobody seems to be interested in determining what the baseline poisoning of, of this land has been. So beet juice being used as de-icer may be another, another aspect of the problem that bees, honeybees and other pollinators are facing. One of the reasons that they don't have as much data as they ought to is because the research that they have is focused on very specific areas. One of the key areas really is soil health. You could get your soil tested at the local cooperative extension, but that's just going to tell you what the pH level is. What we're talking about is very intense testing that will show the actual content of the soil, how many chemicals, what kind of chemicals, you know, all sorts of results. And it's just not something that is available on a large scale. So I think if the powers that be were to incorporate that into the equation, they might be surprised what they find. But once again, you know, they're focused on just very, very specific areas 
and it's not really conducive towards protecting the bees. It's it's more or less to protect industry. It seems that the USDA and the EPA have very carefully avoided uh, any understanding of what the level of poisoning of the environment may be. The only agency that has taken the lead in that is the U.S. Geological Survey, and they've done a number of things. Uh, probably the best known is the uh, multi-year survey that they did of mid Midwestern watersheds, and they found these systemic pesticides, the neonicotinoids, in almost every sample that they took. The key here is that there is no safe level of exposure because the effect on the synapses is cumulative and irreversible. To reach the end point of death or collapse, all you have to do is introduce the element of time. The USGS, on the other hand, has, has actually done this kind of surveying. And we have a recent study, what they've called a reconnaissance study, that was done right here in my home state, not far away in northeastern Colorado, where they, for uh, two years, 2013 and 2014, they were sampling native bees. We, we don't know much about what the effect of these pesticides are on the native bees. Well, that's because there's so many different species of native bees. I did an interview with Dr. Sam Drogi, who works for that agency, and he said, even in your own backyard, there's so many different species that will travel through your backyard, and especially where you live, Tom, even where I live in New York, there's so many different species. Unfortunately, they don't have all the different species identified, so unless it's a, a species that's beneficial to agriculture on a large scale, such as the honeybee, they're not going to give it as much attention as it really needs. And that's unfortunate. You know, this, this whole White House memorandum is supposed to protect all pollinators. And unfortunately, they mostly focus on just one, just one or two species. Well, the evidence is that these systemic pesticides are likely to be much more devastating to the native bees, the solitary bees, than they are to the honeybee. The honeybee is buffered against this damage to some degree because of the size of a colony of bees. They have many, many workers. If they lose a queen mid-season, they have the capability of replacing that queen. So they're somewhat resilient. They're still being killed by these systemic pesticides, but there's a certain amount of resilience to this large population of honeybees. Bumblebees have much smaller populations, so they're more vulnerable. They don't have the ability to replace queens in the middle of a season. Their, their queens are raised at the end of the season, and that's programmed into the, to their genetics. Now, if you look at the solitary bees, they're the most vulnerable of all because every female solitary bee is responsible for the provisioning and, and laying of an egg. And if she's lost, she's lost. Her progeny are, are ended. Many of these, most of these uh, native bees, these solitary bees, we know little about because they don't have mentors like the honeybees do and the monarch butterflies. Uh, this, this study that was done in northeastern Colorado uh, took place over two years, and they were testing for 122 different pesticides and 14 breakdown products of those pesticides. And what they found was they found 19 pesticides present in the native bees that they were trapping and, and analyzing. And Tom, which were the most frequently found neonicotinoids? Well, the most frequently found was thiamethoxum in 40% of the samples, the positives, thiamethoxum was present. In 46% of the samples that were taken, thiamethoxum was present. Thiamethoxum was the most commonly found in their samples. It was in 
of the samples that they took. And thiamethoxam is one of the neonicotinoids, very toxic to honeybees. We're not sure how toxic it is to solitary bees, but likely to be even more toxic. Tom, could you just take a moment and explain to our listeners what it's used for? The thiamethoxam is used on a number of crops. In the case of this USGS re, uh, reconnaissance survey, it was wheat fields that were the primary source, it appears. They, they took samples in both grassland and in cropland, and the cropland consisted of wheat land. Now, wheat is seed-treated and, on occasion, treated by foliar application, and what they found was that the uh, the level of these systemics of the pesticides in the native bees that they were sampling decreased the further those samples were taken away from agricultural land. In other words, if you were in the middle of grassland and the nearest wheat field was uh, a kilometer away, which they believed to be the the outer limit for foraging solitary bees. If the samples were taken from within those grasslands far enough removed from the wheat land, they had the lowest incidence of, of pesticides detected. The closer you got to the agricultural land or in the agricultural land, the higher the, the levels of these pesticide contaminations. Of course, it's just like in the film More Than Honey. More than honey, it in China, there's a scene that was filmed in which you see people hand pollinating the crops. Everything's in bloom. It looks beautiful. It looks fine. However, the bees won't go near it because it's toxic. And this is basically what they this is this is proving, which is something that many of us already know. But the bottom line is is that what it looks like to us doesn't matter. It's the chemicals in the soil that matters. And we can't see the chemicals once they're in the soil and are ubiquitous. And that is basically the pending danger when it gets to the point where the entire environment is one big toxic wasteland. It appears that it is. If you look at the evidence, it appears that it is heavily poisoned. And we're seeing proposals to address the loss of pollinators, which include habitat improvement, but there's been absolutely nothing done to determine what the level of poisoning is in those lands they propose to improve. The evidence that we do have would tell us that they have been massively poisoned and that planting pollinator attractive crops on these lands is a absolutely the worst thing you could do. They're very carefully avoiding this though, because if the public becomes aware of just how massively the environment has been poisoned, there's going to be some people who have to explain their decisions over the past several years. This is a huge environmental disaster in my view. I hope I'm wrong. I don't believe I am. Well, Tom, over the years, we've been talking about this, and it's getting progressively worse. And the solution that's always been presented is basically to sweep it under the rug. I mean, at what point are they going to stop and say, okay, we have enough science? The science has been independently conducted, peer-reviewed, and published. So it's not biased. And industry still is not willing to do anything to back off. And the bottom line is the folks that work for these companies drink the same water that the bees do. Well, there'll, there'll never be enough science, June, because this really at its heart is not a matter of science. It's an issue of money and power. And the EPA has very effectively avoided the science, and ha the chemical industry has as well. We can, we can have science after science after science, and we have. There's an overwhelming avalanche 
of science, well done science, that is condemning these systemic pesticides and the way in which they're being used. The EPA has turned a blind eye to that, and you have to ask yourself why. And it's my view, based on what I've been able to learn, that the management of EPA, at least, is under the complete control of the very corporations that they're supposed to regulate. Well, the bottom line is money. It's always been about money. Right. If you look at every single thing that's going on in this world, it's all based upon money. Money's not a bad thing by itself, but when people are making decisions in which other people are basically sacrificed for the almighty profit, that's when it becomes a problem. It's corporate irresponsibility, and it's contributing to the most massive environmental contamination this planet has ever experienced. And yet, it continues. It's not likely to change until we see someone get in the driver's seat and begin to hold the EPA to certain standards. I've said it more than once on this program that the management, the middle management of the EPA appears to be dramatically corrupted. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing these kinds of decisions. The EPA has become the enemy. This is the agency that was put in place. Its fundamental responsibility was to protect the environment and the people from unreasonable risk. And instead, they make decision after decision after decision that puts the environment and the people at risk but serves the interests of the chemical industry. But that doesn't matter until someone with some courage gets in the driver's seat and begins to demand some performance from this agency. Well, I think it's time that we hop aboard the Monarch Conservation Express. There's an interesting concept, and this this relates to what we've been talking about. The Monarch Express is... Uh, a program of habitat improvement. But to my knowledge, nothing has been done to determine the acceptability of that habitat. I just want to take a moment and share with the listeners what this is about. The Monarch Express, basically, Xerxes Society put out a newsletter in which they said, of all the butterflies in North America, the Monarch can probably claim the largest fan club. Over recent decades, Love for the Monarch spawned a network of loyal enthusiasts growing milkweed, and creating backyard oases across the country. Despite this, years of declining populations in both the eastern and western United States led to a petition to protect the butterfly as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, as well as the focused attention of the White House's National Pollinator Strategy released in May of this year. The government is still considering whether to give the butterfly federal protection, but thanks to the impetus resulting from these national efforts, many organizations are stepping up to climb aboard what might be called the Monarch Conservation Express. Because Xerxes Society has been involved in monarch conservation since the 1980s, quote, we are well placed to be able to move forward the protection of this amazing insect. Our executive director, Scott Hoffman Black, serves as an ex officio member of the Federal Monarch Butterfly High Level Working Group and is co chair of the Monarch Joint Venture. Xerxes staff are also engaged in the U.S. Geological Survey led Monarch Science Partnership and serve on the Keystone Monarch Collaborative Steering Committee. In addition to these collaborations, which enable us to guide national level policy, we are involved in a host of initiatives at the regional and local level across the United States. We should think back uh, a week ago when we were talking about the whistleblower Jonathan Lundgren from South Dakota. One of the reasons that he was being stifled is he'd done research which showed that the monarch butterflies were being poisoned by the milkweed plants because those milkweed plants were drawing up systemic pesticides from the soil. Now here we have the Monarch Express that proposes to plant thousands and thousands of milkweed plants. Now if those are planted on poisoned soil, what do you think the result of that is going to be? I don't think these people are doing their homework. 
I think they're very capable, and I don't know whether they've done this naively or knowingly, but they haven't done their homework. I understand that they're trying to be politically correct, especially with their acknowledgement of the White House's efforts with their national pollinator strategy. However, this is the second strategy, and let's see, it's middle of November, and Tom, can you remind me what exactly has the White House achieved at this point? Uh, let me think for a minute. Oh, no. That would be nothing. <laughs> exactly. And it was supposed to be something that demanded immediate attention. Immediate is not two years later. It's been more like immediate distraction. And some of these groups that the Xerxes Society, Society is involved in, I think, are, are a little bit suspicious because one of the techniques that's used by the chemical industry is to create all these seemingly high sounding committees and commissions and what it does is it diverts attention away from the real problems and uh, I think that that's part of what's going on here. The best example we have of that is what was done in Germany. There was a collaborative effort with the beekeepers in Germany and at the end of 10 years, the beekeepers realized that it was a farce, that it was simply a diversion. It had no intention of solving any of the problems. It refused to look at the pesticide issue, and the, the German beekeepers had the courage to just throw this program overboard. We need to see the same sort of uh, intense scrutiny, I think, in this country. We've been far too accepting. Well, the thing is, is that these organizations are basically in a position where they have to continue raising funds. So, of course, they're going to be politically correct. But at the end of the day, are they there to raise funds or are they there to actually protect the species that they advocate for? That's the question that I constantly ask all of these, all of these folks whenever I come into contact with them because what I don't understand is there are so many activists out there who are paid nothing who are doing it because they firmly believe in it and they are very passionate about doing the right thing. And they don't accept a dime. And these are the hardcore activists that really want to see change and have devoted their lives to doing just that. Whereas you have these NGOs that always have their hand out but are very careful about not offending too many people in order to keep those, those dollars coming in. And I think that's where people, especially this time of the year, when all these NGOs, and for those of you in America that are not familiar with the term NGO, non-governmental agency, or if you want to refer to them as charities, pay attention to who they are currently receiving money from as far as their corporate sponsors. That's a very big indicator. There are so many organizations that are supposed to be focused on protecting the environment or the animals, what have you. And when you take a look at who they're getting money from, it makes you wonder why they're not doing as much as they could. I, I'm not. I think in most cases they don't do this because they're devious. I think they do this because they think they're actually acting responsibly. And and Tom, I don't think so. I don't really? think so. Because when you take a look at the hardcore activists out there, and I know who they are because I work with them. I watch what these people do. I see how hard they work. I see how relentless they are in their efforts. And at the end of the day, they will not take money from anybody. And, you know, this is a small group of hardcore activists. This isn't a large group, but they are sincere. And their sincerity is something that the folks that are involved know who they are, what they're about, and why they do what they do. And there's been so much going around with these organizations that, oh, well, you know, there's no more clean money out there, so we have to kind of pick and choose. Now, that's when you call it a day, and if you have to take money from companies that are creating devastation for the environment, then, you know, game over. Let other people do what is needed instead of convoluting the problem and making things even more complicated. Well, I don't know where the where the truth lies. I think that uh, most of the people who are involved are sincerely concerned. I think that industry takes advantage of that sincerity 
and creates diversionary commissions and committees that keep them occupied but accomplish little and divert their attention from the real problems, in this case, the systemic pesticides. Well, the systemic pesticides should be an issue for all groups that have been created to protect our pollinators. You're talking about birds, bees, bats. The, the poisoning yeah. is very widespread. It's not just the honeybees, and we've made that point repeatedly. The honeybees are the indicator species. They have beekeepers that watch them closely, and any time there's a change in the, in the bees, we see it. And, and I said earlier, we don't have that same advantage with the native pollinators, the solitary bees. We have no idea what's happening with them, but the likelihood is that they're very much more vulnerable to this environmental poisoning than the honeybees are. As you pointed out, this does impact many other species. And one species that I have not had a chance to mention is the raccoon population. Now, for those of you that follow me on social media, I've been posting a lot about raccoons. Basically, it's been brought to my attention that the population in my area, in the New York area, at least on the Long Island area, has been in decline. Now, there hasn't been any scientific data to I explain all the different possibilities, but when you take a look at all the different species that are impacted by the systemic pesticides, it's something that we don't want to think about, but it makes you wonder, okay, is this the next species to go? We don't know how far reaching this is going to be. I don't know if the raccoons are involved in this environmental poisoning, but the longer we go and the more we understand, the further we see the reach of this poisoning. Well, Graham White always jokes around June, how come we don't see frogs on Long Island? You see frogs in certain spots, but not they're not as abundant as they used to be. The same thing with so many other species. I didn't see too many ladybugs this season, this past growing season. I saw one monarch butterfly, even though I had milkweed on different parts of my property. I saw a handful of swallowtails, but that was pretty much about it. That isn't good. I mean, a lot of people are commenting about this, but, you know, the bottom line is what is going to be done about it. The White House keeps issuing these memorandums. Nothing's happening. Who is going to take action? I guess that's the question that remains to be seen. So on that note, to be continued next week. Well, I just want to expand on that a little bit. I think the action has to be taken by the people who are being affected by this, all of us, in other words, because it's apparent that the leadership is not going to do anything here. This is going to require a revolt on the part of the people who refuse to continue to be poisoned like this and see the environment poisoned. The people need to rise up and demand more from their government and from agencies like the USDA and the EPA. As I said, Tom, to be continued. Tom, yes. thanks for joining me. Thank you, June. It's always interesting. And folks, please tune in each week as Tom and I continue to explore the impact of neonicotinoids on the environment. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.